love in the White City is impossible. The streets are too wide, and the wind has rows of perfect teeth. Love in the White City is unlikely. The mud is too deep, and the snow tastes of dogs. Love in the White City is farcical. The roofs are too slanted, and the sky is frozen solid. Love in the White City is laughable. The buses are so slow. The trucks circle the city, roaring all night. Love in the White City is horrible. In February, my cat leaps at shadows. Poets fire guns at noon. Love in the White City is impractical. We're too kind to eat flesh. The handle's broken off. Love in the White City is a mortal sin. The beds creak like swings. The river's too deep and too old. Love in the White City is a TV crime. Arrest me on camera. Brush me with your blue baton. Love in the White City is a poor excuse. The summer's too violent. The spring is barren. Love in the White City is lamentable. That building's full of rich men, and that one, African amputees. Love in the White City is a tragedy, with dancers in black costumes and a continuous mechanical drone. Love in the White City is ridiculous. The natives all know. They'll take it back one day. Love in the White City is unreachable. The chimneys have tried. The ice fog billows and swoons. Love in the White City is forgettable. A cloister of grey nuns, aching to recall. Love in the White City is a nightmare. We're running down Main Street with red clothes and singed hair. Love in the White City is a mystery. Where has my youth gone? Asks the mayor as the gravel trucks sift by. Love in the White City is distasteful. They do it in bushes, on dry leaves, and on grass. Love in the White City is illegal. I explained all my poems, so they buried my books. Love in the White City is a marathon. The sun is too yellow. The trees dwarf our tiny cars. Love in the White City is too brutal. The horses mount cows. The chickens eat pig. Love in the White City is near silent. My eyes froze together. I can't hear you. Love in the White City is blasphemous. I will hunt you down and kill your new wife. Love in the White City is graffitied on all wooden bus benches and young women's fur coats. Love in the White City is cancerous. It grows in the dark 
in tidy black flowers. Love in the White City is moribund, a quick death under the bridge in murder's north capital. Love in the White City is for sale, hard cash for soft breath, a whole district for exchanging seed. Love in the White City is motorized. Large men in pickups, watching women in vans. Love in the White City is in orbit. Two ugly lovers, walking slowly in air. Love in the White City is hard as rock. The bird's song is bitter. The rain hammers down. Love in the White City is unlovely. Your face on a matchbook. Your hands on my back. Love in the White City is dangerous. Take my hand, hold my head. Weep with me to sleep. Love in the White City is expensive. You've cost me everything. I have nothing but you. fronts burning down the suburbs where I played green and sleazy. The marshaled lines of armored SUVs. The Uber homes the middle gentry own on the edge of Dark's wilderness. The brown grass. The apple boughs falling to their knees. I ran, famous among our crab-like trees. Democracy, please speak into the cloud. I read on Sunday, cows are still alive when hanging upside down, their limbs sawed off. Eyes bellowing to the twenty-year man. Didn't used to be like this, he cried. I'm sorry if I quit my pensions lost. Please chain my feet. Cut off my broken hand.
submarine shudders from mount engine. We quietly ship from the slip. Sterning, warning, and flatting across the strait of someone else's dead king. Shouldering past the rump of a robin's egg blue Korean car freighter. Due north is the government's new super coal port and a 10 mile charred line of ore cars drawn against the royal blue horizon. Stretching inland to Canada's open spine, the Rockies Montana and the black stained hills of Idaho. They shuttle forward like convicts in a shackled line and cough up their dead weight onto the multi-storied mounds of ashen rock against a black tangle of cranes. Seawater gushering from tall straight pipes and foam light plumes that arch, fall and land flaccid and spent. Settling onto the quiet, smoke dust beds. The people's new super ferry enters active pass, lolling into the gun metal S. A giant watery snake laid in a wide V of sodden rock. We're horn horning to the little boats to get out of the way. To the passengers on the outer deck, the ship's whistle will sound while transiting active pass. We're halfway there. After all the foreplay and teenaged end of the world angst. Young adult fictions and petty fights with pretty tyrannies. The decay of the body systems is in full swing. The rudder is slightly bent, but knows the way by now. The sewage treatment plant's plugged. The drive shaft has vibration problems, but still spins bright. The doomed engine still runs day and night. An important safety announcement. So much activity in one eye-closing passage, one rocked and fur-shadowed crease in the great divide between sea and sky. Upstairs on the bridge, the ship's toy men masters are playing at the steering wheel. In the cafeteria, the islanders complain about the unfair fare hikes. But the corporation knows the mainlanders will always pay to get even closer to the sun. Everyone knows the ferryman will charge whatever he wants for this rough crossing, this rain-soaked passage. Life jackets are stowed in specially marked boxes. I rudely waken to the hard-ass McDonald's chairs and lost images of tourist wet dream icons passing out the windows like flat TV screens. Their copyright bought last week by Disney Corp. The bus driver asks me, what is on the other side? Probably, says the waitress. The water's where we started. A final shudder from the well below. The iron whale lolls to port side. God's great tongue licks the reefs into white foam. The coffee vibrates in my mortal cup.
was born in Nanaimo, two blocks from the station, three from City Hall and a block from the church. Dad drank black coffee in the Malaspina Hotel, and Mum was a dark-haired beauty of the amateur stage. I was born in Nanaimo, two blocks from the station. A red and white seaplane flew low down the passage, skidding down the harbor to the floating dock on the milky blue glass of the water that day. I was born in Nanaimo, two blocks from the station, the mining shanties in the downtown reserve, the family motel on the road to Victoria, and an RCMP cruiser winding through town. I was born in Nanaimo, two blocks from the station, on a wet and cool September 23rd, in a town of water by a forest of giants, the branches hung heavy with silver for all. I was born in Nanaimo, two blocks from the station, the booming grounds full of stripped orange trees, trussed by a man in a small metal boat, whole forests from the inland mountains laid bare. I was born in Nanaimo, two blocks from the station at the corner of Fitzwilliam and Kennedy Streets. It rained for 69 days without stopping, the fog clung to buildings like old women's hair. I was born in Nanaimo, two blocks from the station. My family was perfect then, no one was sick. The country was new then, and so were we then. The food was like magazines, and the cars were all big. I was born in Nanaimo, two blocks from the station. The steps to our house were covered in moss. But our family was shining from moving and moving. We went to the station and didn't return. I found an old VHS tape recently. It was an edit record of some film footage I shot in 1985 in a suburb called Gordon Head, where I was a teenager. I'd projected the film onto a white wall and reshot it with a friend's camcorder so I could log without scratching my only print. But I never finished that film. The footage was lost. It was thrown in the garbage by an angry roommate. She was pregnant and wanted the room in the fridge for her free food from the clinic and bags and bags of white milk, even though she was a rich girl slumming from the suburbs. I guess she thought she was justified. I was on the other side of the country at the time. That's a long story. She was a tester. She'd test to see if you got mad, and if you didn't, she'd keep on testing you until you got mad. And I never got mad back then. I was proud of it. I used to say I could always see the other person's side of the story. Then, 
she threw my film in the garbage. I started to make the film after witnessing the murder of a 13-year-old girl. She was shot by a sniper in the neighborhood where I grew up. I even lay on my side on the road where she died. I don't know what I expected to feel. Empathy. Sympathy. But it was just hard concrete. I filmed the split levels, service stations, and the air raid siren over the old Gordon Head store while my friend Andrew drew in oil pastels. We talked about the light there on misting, rainy dusks, even though it was just a suburb. I was across Gordon Head Road, getting out of my 1964 Pontiac Canso in my old friend Dave's driveway. I heard a crack that bounced off the houses. It wasn't like a TV gunshot. It was like hearing a thin fracture form in the rest of the day. And as I looked up the girl with her friend, they were barely teenagers in their little jean jackets, laughing hysterically and poking each other on their way to my old Grey Block High School down Gordon Head Road. The girl suddenly jerked her head to one side and fell forward, down and down. She hit hard and skidded on the gravel shoulder. I thought it was strange she didn't put out her hands to break her fall. Some cars stopped and a businessman with slicked hair and a red tie crouched beside her with his man's hand on her little moving back. And I ran into Dave's house and phoned the ambulance. I argued with the operator because there was no 911 in our city yet. And I couldn't find a phone book but she wouldn't connect me or give me the number until I started yelling at her right into the phone that I could see out from Dave's second-story kitchen window straight down at the girl's still writhing body. Her friend bending over, covering her own face with her bird's hands, bending low and bending low, low, her mouth open. And then she connected me and I stood and watched and my old friend Dave there beside me, wondering what? After a while, two ambulance vans came, but she'd already stopped moving. The four men, all in white, went inside a van with the girl for a long time. But finally, three of them exited slowly. Two got into the other van, and one got into the driver's seat of her van, and they backed and turned and drove away without lights. And I kept thinking. Why doesn't this feel more unusual? I mean, I'd already seen it. Thousands of times on TV. Over 18,000 times I read once in a magazine. 18,000 deaths by the time you're 16. But this was real and I didn't feel anything different. Yeah, I felt dead like I was in shock. But that was the same deadness I always felt. Except when I was drunk and felt the panic and anger from feeling dead all the time. Or did I just think I should feel angry or horrified or terrorized at the way things were with the nuclear end of the world? Ronald Reagan, sky blue Chevrolet wagons and all those families and all those silent houses. I used to hit things back then. I punched power poles and thick doors. The pain felt 
right. And for the rest of that day, I suddenly remember what happened. I feel guilty. I thought it was wrong to think about other things. But I just couldn't keep my mind on it. It would move away. I wanted to think something important about it. It was in headlines and people all over the city talked about it. On the sidewalks and in restaurants, it really affected them. Nothing like this has ever happened here, they said. And I was at the next table, but I wouldn't say anything. Just get up and leave. But at work, it turned out I was in a hair trigger temper. And four days after, my boss looked at me. And I realized I'd been yelling at this guy for no good reason. And from my boss's expression, I knew. And he said gently, why don't you take a couple of days off? So I went to Long Beach with Dave. And we camped, and I tried to cry by talking about it on the sand, by the fire, with the waves rushing in at me and out again into the dark. And I did cry for just a second. And I felt a little better. A few weeks later, I went back to school out east. And I might have forgotten about it, except I kept witnessing violence for the whole next year. Little things like rounding a corner on a downtown sidewalk and stepping into a pool of blood with no one else around. Thick and dark red stretching across from the building to the curb. Or a 40-ish woman running in front of a car below the school cafeteria windows. The hollow metal and stuffed pillow sound of her body hitting the hood. Her head knocking in the windshield and her being thrown ten feet, lying in a curled, still lump. And two teenage boys in a knife fight behind the supermarket with red drops spraying all over the white cement and them still circling each other. A crowd of kids with books and knapsacks watching and not moving. And my feet walking me quickly away like it hadn't happened. And the jumper on the subway. The screaming train brakes and the doors suddenly slamming open. And a woman at the front on the platform screaming on and on like she was stuck inside the train brakes, bleeding from my ears and echoing off the plastic tiles as I ran up the escalators as fast as I could, panting, panicking. And finally out into the cold sunlight, gasping for space, and I walked for miles in the cold that day. And in a rich mall, a middle-aged man in a Mackinac had just jumped from the upper tier of the sparkling glass atrium. I was lying in my path as I exited the subway and rounded the orange juice kiosk on my way to class. I almost stepped in the man's face. I stood there as he lay staring up at me with one bulging, red-soaked eye and the side of his face mashed in in purple. And I turned and walked away, but not too fast. Like a criminal trying to look cool. Winding through the crowd, trying to find the goddamned exit. And finally, there was the motorcyclist in the intersection outside my apartment late at night. I ran and put a blanket on him, because I'd heard that's what you should do. But I made the mistake of looking inside the little window of his helmet. His round, gold-framed glasses were shattered. He was smashed and he was gone. girlfriend stood in the middle of the street, gulping for air and hugging herself. 
tight like he used to. Strong but soft after lovemaking. It stopped then. Or I stopped seeing so much of it. And I shot this footage. I even lay down with the camera on the side of the road where she lay dying. Where she died. we rose from a lover's sleep to our windows peering through the Venetian blind crumbling limbs still gaining consciousness a woman's running screal or merely crash a crude thud and splintering safety glass or two men squaring in the black back lot or the deaf lover's quarrel, hands clashing in brown half-light, gesticulation, damned denunciation hanging in the air, their herd voices like feral cats, wounded, keening, guttural, and pleading to please be let in, more naked than any skin. Or the demi-prostitute from Saigon Apartments next door, screaming, sore again at her semi-pimp, suburban boys in ball caps outside her ground floor, their headlights waiting, her prized blonde tresses, thin white dresses, and drunken gait and wail. When I was 16, my parents insisted I stay upstairs and serve cocktails to the women they knew from the university, their significant husbands, a psychologist from our street, and a lawyer in his desperate kilt. Like market surveyors, they asked polite questions about what I liked and what my plans were for the future. I poured them triplets, the only way I knew how to drink from thin McDonald's cups with my friends in my Chevy 2 wagon with no back window. I'd had a better car, but creased it on a power pole at the bottom of the long hill to the bay, with my cartoon handsome and tragically talented friend Anthony. We walked home and sobered up with instant Nescafe, phoned the police from the rec room two hours later, and strolled back to wait. I told them there were no injuries, just my confession. And no one came out of those houses, or even looked out a window from across the street, 
or from the cedar split level five feet from the pole I'd half broken through. The street was deserted and wet, with my useless car bent double. It was very quiet as we sat on the trunk, having shared our first wreck. My tall, beautiful father, who never said much at home, stood with a lawyer and a publisher and another engineer, and one of them said, did you hear the one about the Jew and the Irishman? The Jew was greedy and untrustworthy, and the Irishman was a criminally stupid drunk. And my father's face turned from its usual descended black cloud to charcoal red, his mouth opening at last like a thin, hidden vent in a volcano. And he actually said something. And they were burned by his words. After 20 years of those jokes in Victoria, and they stepped back, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants and their reasonable facsimiles. And they filtered away from my parents' new L-shaped living room with the small oak tree inside, for luck, and the floor-to-ceiling windows. And I loved him. Later, I stepped to my window to look at the moon, which wasn't owned by any of them. My father, who was rarely drunk, stood with his sports jacket open on the flat stone patio, one foot on a planter ledge, and he looked up too, smiling like I'd never seen. We gazed together at the free moon, and he seemed without gravity, for once. Dancing Fs. Fs in signs, many. Fs mounting each other like dogs in a dewy playground. Huge Fs in the sky. Fs moving like stalking insects. Zooming clumsily into and away from Fs. Fs everywhere. Crowds of Fs on sidewalks, F cars at rush hour. Fs falling like snow.
Where would the lines be drawn in the event of war? Well, the war against the weak wages in the air around us, hanging like my poor roommate in his bedroom cell. Neighbor walks softly. Where are the lines drawn now in your relief map of the neighborhood? Well, they're over there. Beyond the new fence we've built with drugstore razor blades, their rented limbs, and our new bloodless technology. Neighbor walks softly. Where would you draw the line if you were told to choose who goes to the bowels of the stadium and who wins a new car? Well, they're coming for you now with feathers and shovels. Have you thought this through? Neighbor, walk softly. What line would you write as a promise to those left behind when we garbage this planet for another? Well, I'd promise to serve my country on a platter to the rocket scientist who builds the ship that takes away the line writers among us. Neighbor, walk softly. I said, where did you draw the line? when we slaughtered the 200,000 desert-faced young men in the Gulf and cleared the homeless with horses and water cannons. Did you bed down at last with the man on TV who said, for God's sake, hold the line? Neighbor, walk softly. Would you line up for bread for a day if there was a loaf for every child? Well, the lines are humming with the news now. We're killing them softly and skillfully in long lines against the neighborhood wall. Les, driving the bus north to Thompson, told us of the blood-drunk Manitoba mosquito, weaving across the highway like a tiny fat mayor of a town's about to die. After feasting with friends on the flank of half-crazed and galloping moose in the deep woods, wheeling off with her pungent mother's load, fatally weaving in front of the bus to Thompson, Sudden and hard as glass, she spread akimbo like a crazy cubist crucifixion. Legs bent and opposing, 
sharp kneed angles. A shattered thin bone swastika from the gathering movement in all insect world. Best of all was the round circle of red, the size of a Canadian dime. Less on the following night driving south from Thompson, said his favorite was when a cloud of fireflies died communally all over his windscreen. And more incendiary cousins collected there as the free sun disappeared in a burnt crimson wash over the black bog. If he could make it through the reserve without the kids smashing his rear windows with their ancient rocks, after flashing his rooftop lights the passing church-bound train. Everyone was asleep and the moon rode high and full of mother's milk that poured down into the bulrush ditches and spread along the length of the 88-mile straightaway south of Moosehorn, where he switched off the headlights. And the firefly torsos glowed for hours after their deaths together spelling new constellations to be read with great care. I dreamt our car was towed away. Our dirty Toyota from my parents' luxury condo parking lot. What the hell did it mean? We've driven that car all over the country. Back and forth and up and down. And my parents are one place. We have this house now and are trying to live in one place. And our dirty car isn't gone, but just takes us to the lake down the road, or around and around and around this muddy town we fell in love with, and we've stayed here and pitched our mortal tent like all the others, under the tan western sky. My parents' condo is where they've moved to die. They'll never move again, except to space, heaven, the eternal ether, and the gracious ground wet and pungent with millennia of crushed bone and weeping piles of leaves. Their condo building was built to be unusually strong, immovable, says my engineer father, who watched its construction and approved its earthquake-proof quality, material, materiality. It has a wide and sturdy stance, like a giant glass and marble headstone, marking all of our graves for us and the clean black parking lots curved on the top of a hill, the land rolling down on all sides. On the following night, my wife dreamt we were refugees. We'd been forced to move to a post-hippie luxury enclave on an island off the west coast. Either we'd been torn from this place by tragic circumstance, or we just forgot that we'd stopped moving and went one move too far. The 
coastal trees gleamed like angry white children in the expensive yellow sunshine. And we walked together, bent over, in utter misery. My mother and father are very beautiful, full of bow jests and handsome profiles against the sky. I love them, and they're very old and joke of dying. I had a cold when they visited our home in Winnipeg. I was afraid they'd catch their death. I was afraid I'd kill them with a microbe as small as the universe. I am afraid of the size of the universe. My mother and father have style and natural dignity, come from pain and hurt and passion that moved them across the world. They cut a fine figure like a clipper on the western horizon. You can just see their masts now. Their hull has gone below the rim, proving the world's round. I love them, but my faith is that they'll never leave me. My lovely dad always promised me he wasn't gonna die. And my mother's soft smile and guiding hand in the philosophies of the world will live in me and my atoms in every hand I shake and in the juice of every tree's leaf on this battered spaceship, our parent Earth. My mother and father are home again as their vitamins kept them alive, for now. They deserve a few peaceful years, if deserving something's a concept were allowed in this plane. I love them and I'd make wide and strong wings for them, if I knew how, with white mottled feathers and unbreakable bones.